we are here for the last panel on the last day of the seventh year of the Sync Up Conference in uh, the New Orleans Museum of Art, and we are thrilled to have such an illustrious panel joining us for this panel on artist development, what artist development means in this day and age. And Jeff is taking a selfie. No, I'm taking oh, okay. <laughs> And so we've got two very experienced <laughs> professionals in the world of artist development. You've already met Jeff Castellaz, who is many things, including president of Electra Records and an artist manager and former owner of an independent record label. Please welcome Jeff. And also Dick Wingate, who is a veteran of a mm, number of years in the music industry, various positions at pretty much every major label, major indie, been everywhere, done everything. Also a strategic consultant for digital media initiatives and also now has a new independent record label, the name of which is? BHI Music. And the motto is, we make records. <laughs> and yeah, thank you, welcome Dick Wingate. And also, it's wonderful to have on an artist development panel an artist who is also a label owner and entrepreneur, Alex Ebert of the band Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. Thank you so much for being here. So, um, Alex, I thought we would start by uh, embarrassing you and just making sure that everybody knows exactly why we're all so thrilled that you're here. So, Tony, can we play that? Just, to, just for... <laughs> song. So I think if it's fair to say that, that maybe... Song, you're, 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 if you haven't heard that song, you're, you must be deaf. Right. right. <laughs> Has that song been in any, any uh, commercials by any chance? I think, yeah. Oh, sorry, right. uh, NFL, maybe? NFL and probably some other stuff. Incidentally, not the iPod commercial that Monsters and Men did, even though it sounds identical. <laughs> we got calls like, oh, congratulations. We're like, we didn't, that's not us. Oh, man. All right, well, so anyway, the, uh, arguably the song that uh, most people know you for, the one that put you guys on the map. Um, so, Alex, what I'd like to do, since in addition to the, owning your own record label, as an artist who makes his career performing, touring, doing all that great stuff, and these guys are professionals, who deal in artist development. Could you just kind of be a fly on the wall for a minute? Yeah. And let's listen to what these guys say. Let's hear. And, um, and, and let's see if there's anything that they say that you vehemently disagree with. And I'm kind of hoping that there is. I've brought a whole bunch of absurd statements. I'm going to see <laughs> how few things I can say before his alarm goes off. Okay. <laughs> so guys, let's, this panel is on artist development. Very broad term. To some of us, it means something specific. To some of it, doesn't. Could each of you just sort of take a second and give your take? If, if I were to say to you, artist development, what does it mean what, to you, in your, just for, theoretically and also in your practical life? OK, well, Dick has just elected me uh, to go <laughs> first. So well, the, the, I was thinking this morning about what we were going to talk about. And the fact is, is that for me, artist development is like an affliction. Um, I never had the audacity to do what Alex does. I, I am a musician and a writer, but I never, I just never had the guts to get out on stage and, and put myself there. I just couldn't do it. So I've taken all the energy that I might otherwise have 
had I gone down that path of being a performer or an artist or even a songwriter. Um, and I, I have this sort of OCD with um, every artist I work with, whether I'm a manager or whether I'm the label or whether I'm the publisher, um, which is always a very interesting role to play. If you're just the publisher for somebody, you tend to piss off a lot of people uh, by stepping in and trying to help out an artist um, and stepping on the label's toes or what have you. So I, I think it becomes an obsession for me. Um, I'm a numbers, I'm a crazy numbers person. I'm motivated by uh, seeing numbers grow, uh, both um, both in terms of adding and multiplying. And um, I can't sit across from an artist uh, or listen to an artist's song and think, oh, I have to be in business with this artist without getting that crazy feeling inside of me that, you know, I could fall in love with this artist and talk to them every day, text with the manager 500 times a day. And um, it's a little bit like having an addiction to a drug or something for me, um, to be very blunt about it. It just, it really is. And I, um, and I'm happy to say that it works for me and it's, and it certainly has worked for a handful of artists that I've worked with over the past 20 years. Not all of them, but a handful of them. And, um, and so I is guess- Is that because that's your approach to business or because you're just so in love with the music that it fills you with that both. kind of- It's both. I mean, I could be into um, owning a coffee shop and I would have the same, I would have the same mania for what I'm doing. It's just that I happen to be, music happens to be the thing that saved my life when I was a child. It was a way for me to, um, See, I have, a fan, I have a fantasy problem. And so I can imagine when I'm racing a bike or riding a bike 150 miles in a day or, or um, hearing a song by an artist that comes through my email, I can imagine what, what things might look like 10 miles down the road, right? I, I can imagine what it looks like. I always say to people, like, what we're doing right now is we're doing all the stuff that if we get it right, it's going to be in the Wall Street Journal story in two years right, the, the, as they say, the 10-year overnight success. And um, Fitz and the Tantrums, an artist that I've worked with for almost five years, is, is one of those stories that I won't get into in this particular question, but over time today I will. You know, you're taking a guy who was far too old um, to have the kind of radio hits he's, he's having, not by my rules, but by society's rules, uh, and with a co-lead singer who's an African-American woman, and getting them on radio formats that play neither old people nor uh, African American or, or any African anything, whether they're British, French, Canadian uh, voices at all. And so um, that obsession, that mania that I had along with the artist for sure, because it's always about them and the manager and the publicist, that type of thing, um, to me, that's the sort of the bucket that artist development goes into. It's really not that great if you're my wife, because you know I'm just sort of cracking off on things all the time, because I want my people to get ahead. Because, uh, and I'll stop on this. Like if I make a commitment to somebody, like I got to be there ten minutes early, and I got to be like doubly prepared. Otherwise, what the hell am I doing? Like I don't want to be that guy who signs up to do a job and just completely punts it. Then. That, there's plenty of people out there who will do that. I just don't want to do that myself, you know? That's what major labels do. <laughs> oh, wait, I run a major oh, label yeah, that's now. That's right. Oops. <laughs> Oops. So, all right, so passion, 100%, 150% commitment, and... Insanity. Just insanity. call it insanity. Mania. Yeah. Full-on yes. mania. Yes. Dick, is that artist development for you? Well, it, it's certainly part of it, and, and I can really... Jeff and I just met today, but I can... I. I feel a, a, a kindred spirit with him because my whole career has been in, in, about the, the passion that I have when I discover something new, whether it was an artist or a company, as I work with a lot of different companies as well. And um, right back to the early days when I was a, a college radio DJ, it was, it was a thrill for me to expose new music that was just such a joy if I got a call from a listener saying, man, that was just awesome. You know, I was good for another week. And I was lucky enough to um, become the marketing and product manager for a number of major artists uh, in their early days at Columbia Records, including Elvis Costello's 
first three albums I did all the marketing for, and, and Bruce Springsteen's Darkness on the Edge of Town. And I've Peter heard of Tom. him. Yeah. Uh, I think he's got a gig I, is, somewhere. Is, is he playing this weekend? Uh, yeah. Somewhere. He's playing uh, somewhere. Um, and uh, the, the first two Peter Tosh solo albums, and just talent. I was working with a level of talent, which was none of which was established yet. That was just, I mean, I, I remember thinking, I'd walk into the office and I thought, they pay me for this? I, I, if they told me they couldn't afford to pay me anymore, I would, still would have come to work. You know, it, it was just. I, I've been in that position before. Yeah, yeah, right. It's called owning an independent label. Yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, but to, to the point of, of what, was, what was artist development then, um, was a long-term commitment. We, we never launched an, an artist without thinking it was a two or three album minimum time frame. Um, in some cases that would take, with Bruce, the albums were many years apart. Um, but you could do that then. You could go away for, an act could go away for three years and it, it wasn't that on, today if, if you don't release music for three years uh, the sad reality is that a lot of artists are forgotten if they don't release music on a pretty regular basis. And so the unbundling of the album, of course, has, has made that. And we could talk about that in a minute because I think that's an important um, factor to how you, how you, you know, to artist development is consistent product, I hate to use the word product, consistent release of new music to keep the fan base stimulated and coming to the gigs. It's and not the world the old, has just sped up so much because yeah, of social media. It's not the old, media. let's let's put out an album every 18 months or, or two years, which it was back then, but but with and with Elvis Costello, he put out th his first three albums in, in 18 months total. Total. I had to, I had three album campaigns in 18 months. So it was like 0 to 100 miles an hour. But but artist development then was mostly about, you know, touring, ra radio, touring. And, and press. Then we got into, and I would call that artist development 1.0, because you, you named this panel artist development 3.0. So that was 1.0. Artist development 2.0, and I think there's more than three, by the way. I would have, I would have called Take this. Take as many as you like. 2.0 was in the 80s, when MTV just warped everything. Uh, artist development in the 80s became get a video on MTV, literally. That was, if you could get a video on MTV in any decent rotation, you would sell a lot of records. And that was great for some artists and also became a real burden for some artists because they weren't necessarily videogenic. And, uh, you know, a lot of the greatest artists of our time would have never made it if their first records came out in the 80s because they could have never been on MTV. I've become well, obsessed with the cars. Again, recently, <laughs> they're on elect. They were on Electra, and I, I was uh, listening to them a couple weeks ago obsessively. They were a perfect example. Oh my they're god! Ugly as sin. Look at a photo but of those they, dudes. It's like unbelievable. But the videos were great because yes. they were well directed and well conceived. Uh, and the songs were good. Yeah. Oh yeah. Right. I forgot about that part. <laughs> but you still had to be on MTV because that's where the action was. That's where the kids were. All right. So what's three? So, okay. So. Let's, let's talk about what comes after MTV. MTV okay. ran its course, right? And then they started doing you know, reality TV programming and, and, uh, and everything else. And you had this sort of in-between period before the internet was as in, you know, permeated society the way it does today. Um, there was uh, the kind of 90s, the, that decade of the 90s was really driven by pop radio for the most part, after the grunge thing kind of ran its course. It was driven by pop radio, and you had all, all the uh, pop acts, the NSYNCs, the Backstreet Boys, the Britneys, the, you know, the list goes on and on and on. It was real. So you had artists, that little era was really driven by t top 40 radio. That's what sold. That's how you got records sold. Now we're in, so I, you could call that- 2.5? Three or 2.5. Right? Whatever, make it four. Right. <laughs> Now we're in an era where the internet is the primary mode of communication for learning about acts, he, he, listening to acts for the first time, discovery. It's a completely new platform. 
and it it's the with there are so many channels within that platform, whether it's social media, or whether it's iTunes, or whether it's uh, Spotify, or whether it's Instagram. I mean, there's just so today an artist development campaign, and I know I'm running on. I'm sorry, is is has to be consider all of those channels. And of course, the performances at the end of the day are going to be, you know, what will determine whether an act is going to have any longevity. They can have a hit without being a great performing act. You can be, I mean, you'll be forgotten, but you'll have a hit. You'll be Gangnam style, you know? So I'll stop there for a minute. All right. Alex, bear with me for another minute. I have another question for these guys. So, um, all right, so we talk about artist development, and, and Dick, you were getting to a part of that kind of nostalgic uh, 1.0, if you like, notion that we have of this term, artist development, where we think of, we say, it's, it's, it's sort of a cliche to say now, there's no such thing as artist development anymore. Labels don't do it. There, there, there is no support for artists in the way that there was, as though the 70s or 1.0 was, was this halcyon glory days of artist development. And, and, and I guess what we're, we're imagining when we say that is that labels would, as you were saying, give you plenty of time. You could have plenty of records, which the flip side of that means they sun signed you up for endless numbers of options and kept you forever, but more benevolently with the expectation that record number one isn't necessarily gonna sell so much and record number two may not sell so much, but you're developing that traction and developing that fan base. And they give you all the time in the world without booting you off and keep giving you advances for more records. And then eventually they would stick with you until something would pan out. And that this mentality no longer exists today. Is you guys both are involved in, in your, your daily lives with, with labels, with finding new talent, developing new talent. Is it true? Is there no such thing as artist development at labels anymore? I think there is. I think it depends on the, um, the label. I think it depends on the deal that was done between the artist and the label. Um, I personally have never done large dollar deals ever. And, uh, and, and there's, if you cut up the three of us in many different ways, um, you know, talking about a 360 deal, which we do at Warner Music, um, pretty much across the board, where we're involved in the touring, the music publishing, merchandising, records. We're involved in every business. I was doing that at Danger Bird, the indie label that I founded, um, starting in 2004. Um, that, that may, Alex will certainly have feelings about that as an artist, of course, but Alex has also not had a traditional path as an artist either, which I'll let him, I'll let you talk about that. You, you, you've not been a guy who's like sitting there with a cup asking a label to, to, to help you out. You've, you've created your own path, which to me is the best artist development anybody could ever have. But we, um, we do long-term deals uh, at, at Electra. I did it, everything I'm gonna say I did at Danger Bird as well as an indie. We do long-term deals, we do 360 deals, which I hate the term, but bear with me, please. But that also means that I'm the dude... Just explain to the audience what that means. Yeah, I, I just said it, it involves a deal that we won't just sign you for records only, that would be like game over for me. We, we do a deal with you where we have, we give you a co-publishing deal, where we, we're involved in getting a piece of your touring net, a, what ends up being a small piece. Um, we, we do your merchandising, uh, which you're going to do a deal with someone for merch anyway, so we're, we want to do that. We want to do your online um, sales. Again, you're going to hire someone to do that anyway, so we want to do that. So instead of going to six, seven different companies, you do everything with us. And as a result, as we're investing money in the artist and building the artist, if everything goes well, we're not sort of sitting there um, getting our return on records only, which is the smallest piece of the pie, and also the piece of the pie that has the single highest expense, which is where you make the records, the music videos, all of the imaging, the, the, the artwork, the logo, the photos. And uh, there's one band that I did not have on 360 at Danger Bird, and, and, and uh, we ended up selling almost, almost two million records. They're called Silver Sun Pickups, and they had either five or six number one modern rock singles. And it was just, when I signed them, you couldn't do a 360 deal as an indie, it was just unheard of. They would have, they would have run screaming from me. 
Um, conversely, when I signed Fits in the Tantrums, we did a, a, a holistic deal, and we're all happy. But it means that for me, I'm the guy who's like trying to get you off your crappy agency and trying to get you to a great agency. I'm the guy who's standing there taking all the bullets from said crappy agency when so, when the managers call and say, we're firing you because he said so. So you, know? you are say, and tell me if I'm understanding you correctly. You're saying that a 360 deal in which the label has a piece of your touring income, your merchandising, your publishing and everything is actually artist development today. That is the label taking a developing role, uh, which is probably the most benevolent description of a 360 deal I've ever heard. Well, because it's... <laughs> That's fair enough, but, but again, and, and Alex, when he gets to line us up on the wall in a minute, will have his opinion about this. But in other words, if I'm investing um, in your corner restaurant, let's say you own Coquette on Magazine Street and I invest in you. I should be so lucky. And, um, and, and let's say we had a deal where it said, like, I'm only going to get my, the return on my investment through the sale of your appetizers. Like, nobody would ever sign up for that deal, right? If I'm going to invest in your business, I want to get a return on everything in the business. But they used to. The business uh, has changed. Yeah, but the, the reason is that the, the, uh, the appetizers used to have such a significant revenue stream that you could afford to be in business just if you had the appetizers. And that's enough. just not the case anymore. They're, they're, you can't afford to make records and market them and make videos if the only revenue stream is on the sale of pre-recorded music, because it's just a fraction of it, what it used to be. It's not sustainable, and I, and I will say that um, the way I relate the 360 deal to artist development is that like, if we're in business and there's parity, you know, and there's alignment between, be, between um, all of the artist businesses and, and the, the label as the chief investor, um, I'm making investment decisions across the board um, because I'm getting a return from all revenue sectors. And I want to point out, there have been booking agents who have been part of this conference. I just want to point out to, ev to everybody and people on the radio and this and that, let's never forget who's getting away with all the money in the music business. Let's never forget. Booking agents are getting a 10% return. They put no money on the table. They have no risk in the game at all. They, in some states in the United States, have, have a, a, a Byzantine aged license that goes back to like the mafia days of the 1920s that allows them to represent talent because managers weren't allowed to sell, to sell live shows, right? And by the way, I love agents. But let's never forget, we're giving somebody 10% off the top. Alex plays a show. The promoter sends a deposit in. It goes into the agency's escrow account. The agency takes their commission out of that and then forwards the rest of the money to his business manager. They don't even have to wait for their money. I'm the guy. I sign an artist. I'll put up a million dollars if I put up a dollar to launch the entire thing. And I'm supposed to wait three years to make money from iTunes? Like I, there's just, that would be unsustainable. We would, the whole thing would come crumbling down. So I would say that artist development is brand development now. Right. So, and, and so that's why the, the license holder, the, the label, needs to ha is creating a brand and therefore has to have a piece of the action for across the spectrum. It's the only way it can work. And when it, and when it works well, and you, you all may have um, uh, ideas about these artists, uh, you may or may not like these artists, but when it works well, you get a Bruno Mars, right? When, it, when a label is developing whole hog in an artist um, from, from I, just, I just ran across, Bruno was on Elektra uh, for his first album before I was involved with Elektra. And I just, somehow I was on the internet the other day and I hit a button and I saw this tweet come up from three or four years ago and it said, Bruno Mars, uh, apostrophe, Bruno Mars is, first um, headline show in New York City at Bowery Ballroom, you know, May 14th or whatever. Tickets go on sale next week. And you can all laugh about that now, right? The dude's probably doing four nights at the Barclays Arena in Brooklyn and could probably do eight if he wanted to. So someone had to invest in all of this guy's um, business. And when it, so when it, worked, when it turns out well, 
you get a Bruno Mars or a Paramore or a Wiz Khalifa or what have you, or an Ed Sheeran, who's one of our artists who I'm very proud of. And, um, and when it doesn't work out well, I'm sure Scott's going to, you know, pepper us with one of those questions in a minute. But when it doesn't work out well, it didn't work out well anyway, whether you had a records-only deal or not. And um, I, I always say this, like, I'm 41 years old. It's not my fault. Man, I was, I was like, born into this system where, where people were signing artists to record deals because they, they were reselling everybody their record collection on CD. It's not my fault. I inherited this problem. I'm just trying to solve it. And what I do in my, in my daily life, Scott, is I try to tell people the, the honest truth from the minute I meet them. Here's how much money we have. Here's what we're going to do. If you ever catch me not following through or any of my people, please pick up the phone and call. Please uh, put a mirror up to me because um, I might not like it, but it's my job to take it. So that's what I try and do, and I try and follow through. And I'm proud of like someone like Fitz and the Tantrums, who, when I signed him, were playing the Hotel Cafe in LA, which is like a you know 150, I don't know 180 people if you really jam it, and the fire inspector doesn't come that night. And they're now playing, you know, they're now selling 5,000 tickets a market in the U.S. across the entire country, sometimes more. And they're at the top of all the festival bills. So that's what you get when I'm invested in your entire business. So, it, so artist development still exists at labels, and labels yeah. are willing, uh, they're investing, but they also want a piece of the, the holistic pie, as you put it, uh, in, in order to justify that investment. Dick, do you want to add anything on to does artist development that's, still exist? You said it. artist development is brand development. But they have to amortize the investment across all those income streams. Um, but I think, and, and I mean, Alex may be able to speak to this as well. There, there, are, there are different kinds of, uh, the label may take on an artist at, a, at different points of development. So a lot of what we're talking about is real baby, baby acts that really have no established base. Um, but if, if an album is picked up by a label that's already got some traction, in the market as an independent release or the artist's own label, um, then the, the economics may change a little bit. The deal may change a little bit and, and there'll be more, um, you know, maybe there won't be a 360 deal because the band can withhold, you know, withhold a piece of, uh, of one piece of their business. Maybe they already have a merch deal. Um, so you ha there isn't a one size fits all um, deal and then, but artist development is still is is a very hands-on, malleable um, service for each act because every act is different, and some need a lot more creative direction than others. You know, if 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 Alex signs to a label, he's not really going to need any creative direction. He may seek to have business direction, but. He probably, he may not want, I, I don't want to speak for him, he may not well, want any creative. Alex has been sitting here very patiently, <laughs> so, so are you ready to take a swing at these guys yet? Oh, Have they said anything that's pissed you off? No, I just, you know, the, I think that the, this is an even broader question than, than we realize. I, I think, um, why was music better in the 70s than it is now? Um, there was a smaller stream of the output um, there were fewer artists and more sort of concentrated efforts and they had to jump through more hoops to put out albums. Um, if they couldn't write good songs, they were paired up with tremendous songwriters. Um, that still happens now in the pop world, but for the most part, you're expected to do your own thing. My experience um, with major labels and really any label is, what's the story? Why am I signing you? Not oh, I'd like to lift a f single finger to help develop you, but what's your thing that you're bringing to me? Because I really don't have time if you don't already have it lined up. That's my experience with labels. What's your story? In fact, that's the experience I have with l radio. Let's get the song on the radio. What's the story? The story? What do you mean, what's the story? <laughs> it's the fucking song. <laughs> Put the fucking song on the radio if you like it. Oh, but, no, but no, you can't do that because the song has to have a story. There's got to be a story behind it. That's what well, everybody says. Well, the story says. is... 
50 Cent got shot eight times. That's why you should listen to, this, to, the, to the song. I remember when 50 Cent came out, everyone's like, oh, he got shot. And I'm listening to the song. I'm like, okay, so that makes the song, yeah, I guess the song's better because of that. Um, <laughs> you know, it, you got to have some kind of story. Or you got to have, you got to bring, I, I feel that the artist is expected to basically bring basically everything to the table. That's my experience. So like, the artist has to come fully formed, fully developed, already ba developed. Basically, the artist has to come with a hit. Unless you're Britney Spears and they're like, she looks really hot and we're going to hook her up with a, 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 a writer. And you're really doing that kind of like complete magic trick. Um, yeah, an indie band, yeah, yeah. You gotta have, you have to come to the table with basically everything. They'll hook you up with some, you know, a video and this and that. What, the way I view labels is actually as marketing. I don't see any development other than development of the brand, as you said. But I don't, I've never felt from them. I was on a major label, Virgin, for a long time. I, I, I have approached uh, various, various major labels just dabbling with Edward Sharp, like what do you, you know, and it's all about, hmm, I don't hear the song. That's it. There's not like, ooh, what if you did this? No, no, no. And maybe they think they can't approach me that way, but it's, it's really, I don't really have time for this. I'm trying to make hits and make money. That, that's, that's basically all I see. And then, you know, with regard, it's very interesting, the 360 thing, the reality is the, the appetizers used to be entrees. It's not that the appetizers used to be more lucrative, they used to be entrees. So what's the entree now? Um, you know, I, I think that that's, I, I guess touring is, has always been the sort of, the big deal, but the reality is there's just less money. There's just less money. In the 90s, there was something called selling out. Now, that doesn't exist. If you see a band on, the, on, the, on, the, on a commercial, people get excited now. They don't now stop following them. They actually go, they shazam it. And they're like, wow, this is so cool. Because there's no more selling out. Because we're back to this era, as I was telling Jeff yesterday, of the Medici, basically, where there is only selling out. Where you basically, they come to you and they're like, paint me with Jesus. And you, and, you, and you go, oh, yes, sir. Like, we're just the court jesters now. It's very exciting to get an offer from Samsung. It's very exciting to get an offer from Sony. Really, that's, that, that, that's to me, the 3.0, where we're... It's brand development. It's brand development, but it's also... It's also one of the only revenue it's streams. Only, it's, it's one of the only revenue streams, and it's also the other radio. You can get on radio, or you can get a commercial. Um, really, social media... You're, you're hopefully tweeting, I'm on a commercial or I'm on, you know, this TV show tonight. Because you can't just tweet in a vacuum. So you, you, you're usually trying to tweet about something that you've, that you've accomplished or whatever. With Edward Sharp, I had just come off a thing with Virgin and we, I'm a robot, my previous band had gotten one of the very last big giant deals. And we spent a lot of money. We were like $3 million in the hole when they cut us loose. Um, and that was just on like making albums somehow and touring it. So anyway, so like they just knew, they were used to spending money, it was that era. And we came off that, and I came out of that really just like, okay, I'm never, first of all, everything I did was my fault. I know that now. Like I got pressured into working with this producer, that producer, like major labels. They actually did try and do artist development, but only in the sense like, we're gonna put you with the, we're gonna repeat successes. We're putting you with a guy who did Breaking Benjamins, this like alt rock, hardcore thing that nothing to do with my band, but he made a successful album. So we're putting, process overtakes content. That's, that's, how, that's how repeating successes work, where you're like, oh, well this worked, so we're gonna do this again, and then, and then again and again, and you get just stale. You get more content, uh, more process than content. So I was like, I'm never doing that again. I'm building everything from the ground up from here on out. And Edward Sharp was in the, the age of the internet, as you guys were saying. So the age of the internet, I sort of just knew now that it's on me. I, I'm a robot pre-virgin, I did all the work. I went around posting stuff everywhere. I, I created an entire culture in LA. And you don't was, mean Facebook posts? No, fa there was nothing. I didn't even have an internet account. I didn't even have a cell phone, I don't think. I, I just, you go around, you, I'm, I'm, I had beef with that guy Obey, like for instance. I, like, you know, the guy who does the, he did the Obama thing, he pastes things up everywhere. Anyway, he had, we had beef, I was a tagger, basically. So like, I, I, 
I was a very proactive promoter of my thing on my own. As soon as I got to a major label, I let it all go. Because yeah. they're like, we got it, son, and, and we're going to do the thing. And so you're like, OK. And then all of a sudden, you're not working. And you're like, well, well, what's going on? Why aren't you guys doing this? Why aren't you doing that? And I lost that inertia. And then when I left, I, re I basically have decided I'll never lose that inertia again. You got it. You're basically your own artist developer. Like, if you're an artist, you got to do it yourself. That's, that's my experience. And sometimes you'll, maybe you'll run into someone like Jeff who, who, who wants to see you sort of like he sees something and he wants to develop it. But I will say my experience is that almost everyone wants to hear the thing more or less in its complete form and more or less ready to go onto the, onto the big scene. If they don't get it, Edward Sharp, people didn't get that. No one was like, oh yeah, home's a hit. We had to just, I just had to know that and know that this was going to be a groundswell. And in fact, we played our first show at a place called The Troubadour, and my manager immediately said, we could play the El Rey. It was such a success. We can jump from a 300 club to an 850 club, like, next month. But I said, no, I want to play houses and sweaty little weird bars and build this, you know, and, and, build, and build the culture of this, build this thing from the ground up, not skip any... Steps. I actually didn't want to play in any established venues. That was my big thing. Uh, no established venues. And, uh, and we did this thing downtown at this theater, and we did it all ourselves. And eventually, you end up playing some established venues, but then if eventually you get to a place where you actually don't have to. We put on a whole circus tent thing. And the reality is, home was never really on the radio. Um, it was on college radio and some, you know, barely on alternative. One, here and there, some markets, some alternative. It was a cultural hit. It was just a thing. You know, it's on some commercials and whatnot, but um, we struck a we struck a chord, and and I think that my last thing about artist development, one thing that hasn't been talked about, I think is the most important thing is the development of the songs themselves, the music, not the brand. So, what I've really discovered is that it's really you're going to have success if you're writing great songs, and and if you're performing them well, if you have that combination. If you can put yourself out there, let go of all your bullshit and, and get wild on stage, whatever that means to you, and have a great song as well, you're gonna do good. You know what I mean? That, that's, that's what we did. And, and I think the development of the songs, the mania is just as important on the business side for an artist to develop yourself. You have to be completely maniacal about it. You have to somehow develop that OCD, I'm gonna write this song and make it better and better and better. Now I'm gonna write another song. Oh, it's better than that song. I better go back to that song and make it just as good. You gotta just start like <laughs> trying to write the best songs you can over and over and just keep writing songs like all day, five songs a day, whatever it is, go back to them. Ideas at the piano, like pissing off the people you love because you're so focused on writing great songs. That's my theory. Well, you know, there's a difference between A&R and artist development. And, and, and in some cases, some labels are better at one than the other, and the, the, line, the line can, can get blurry. But it, at least with the big companies, there's an A&R person who signs the act, and then there's a marketing person who's also sort of in, in charge of, of artist development in association with the A&R person, right? So some, what you're saying is you're, you're, in, you're in control of, of A&R, that's the creative part. And on the artist development side, you felt like you needed to take control of that as well. And, it's, and so far, it's worked for you. Well, I guess so. But artist development means technically more of the marketing. Is that because I, I thought artist Yeah, it's kind of, it's, it's sort of, in my, it, historically, artist development was, OK, what do you do with this music after it's already been recorded? I see. Right? I see. But it, it could also be A and R. That's why I'm saying there's there's a. It's I a thought it meant how do you give an artist a long career? Well, that yes, over time, of course. But but in the uh, the traditional record major record companies, they would have artist development departments, and they were primarily tasked with well, getting them on Alex the right tour, getting them on the right tour, and and looking for opportunities for them outside of the normal radio and sales promotion. Well, how about Alex's point that his experience with major labels, certainly, and you guys both have plenty of that, is that uh, 
they're happy to take an artist development role once you've already done all the heavy lifting. You've already got 30,000 sound sand sales. You're already selling out 200-seat yeah, yeah, rooms. You've already, you've already done all, all of the heavy lifting. Is he right? Yeah, I think that, that, I think that that's a, absolutely right. I personally don't get involved in that. Now, if somebody comes to me and has an amazing single and they're looking for a deal, I kind of look over both shoulders and wonder, because there's no, um, Tom Wally said this to me a couple months ago. He's like, uh, this guy who used to run Warner Brothers Records, and he now has a small indie label, and he was like, man, any, any artist we find, there's already 10 people there. There's no finding out about shit early right, anymore right. because of the internet, because of, well, because of email. Right. Because files are so small now, or you can send, like, a you send it link, so everybody gets it like that. Like every manager, even the crappiest new manager, can figure out 20 people's emails and send them the same music. But the thing is, is that um, there are some of us who are looking for little jewels that they can start building up. And you get lucky once in a while, like you open up that. Is it a clam or an oyster that has a pearl in it? Oyster. Oyster, thank you. Uh, linguistic development is what I'm involved in today. So you once in a while you open an oyster and there's like a giant pearl in it and that would be like a great song ready to go. Um, and once in a while you there's a there's a bunch of other things that are great about an artist. You know they're a very early stage. You might like them as people, which is something I really enjoy. I certainly don't want to work with jerks, and and vice versa. Somebody might think I'm the biggest ass on earth, and they don't, after one meeting they don't want to no, deal no. with me. Um, you know, so you got to have that, and you might say, oh, these people um, have only written like a quarter of a great song ever, but I, I just like their drive, I like who they are, I like their lyrics, I like the singer's voice. I get, I mean, I'm developing all kinds of bands, um, and then I do have some that walk in the door fully formed, without a doubt, Fitz and the Tantrums, who, I, I, you know, Fitz and, and, and Alex went to school together a hundred years ago when we were all young, and Fitz is a guy who came in my door. I will never tell this story any differently. The truth is, Michael Fitzpatrick made an album with his own money. He'd done music. This is so funny. Uh, and you may not even know this whole story. Fitz uh, worked with this guy called Mickey Petralia in L.A., who's a record producer. They had started a business together. Fitz was Mickey's assistant, at making records with people, like Ozo Motley and... I don't even know what else to do. He, he, I don't know. Maybe he worked with the Beastie Boys and back all kinds of shit like that. Fitz was like literally the guy that would go to Starbucks who would like edit drums and Pro Tools and like some back room. He was like that guy. And he was constantly trying to come up with one band, a uh, solo persona, a band, this rapper thing, alternative folk thing. Like he was trying out all this stuff over time and it never took root. So his uh, thing was working with this guy, Mickey P, in the studio. And then one, one day they decided, we're going to start doing music for commercials because we keep getting calls from ad agencies to do, a little, uh, to do music. That took off so well for them. They got like a Taco Bell commercial, a Burger King commercial, a Purina Dog Chow commercial, right? I mean, all that stuff has music in it. It's corny, but whatever. And they did really well with it. And so that... Uh, made fit so much money in residuals that he had he, he bought a house and in the living room of that house this doesn't happen just in New Orleans this happens in LA too he he bought uh, bought like a pro tools rig and got a whole bunch of old instruments and he had a studio his whole living room to this day is like a studio and he made this record starting with one song he found an organ on the side of the road um, he came home, he plugged it in, and he started playing this riff, and it was the beginning of Fits in the Tantrums. It was this, you know, what is Fits in the Tantrums? They're like one foot in Motown 1964, and as he iterates the band, it's more now like Hall & Oates, kind of 80s cool pop stuff, right? But he started out with this organ riff, which is where he got the whole Motown idea, and he built this whole thing on his own, and when, by the time he met me, he had already put out an EP, he toured a little bit. He'd spent all of his money. He said hello to me at La Mill Coffee, which you know, maybe some of you guys have been to L.A. Um, it's just this spot in Silver Lake that we all go to. It's like our little commissary, like the place on Friends, TV show I never watched, but I know they all hung out at a coffee shop. 
And there was this guy. This is a great story, and it's going to make me look like an ass, which is what you guys all came for, right? <clears throat> to see us uh, cut each other up. So there's this guy with this flock of seagulls hairdo is what I used to call it, this hair that came down over here. And I was like, fuck, I don't, who, this guy's like some A&R guy or something. I don't want to talk to him. I thought he did A&R for Warner Brothers or something because I always saw him with this young lady who worked at Warner's. And one day I went in there to get a, an espresso. And I was leaving and the flock of seagulls guy was sitting right there. And I was walking out and he said hello to me. Like the worst thing that could ever happen. The guy says hello to me. And I turned on my heel and I was like, because I, I know just enough in life you know, you, don't, you can't be rude to people. You got to turn around and say hello. So I turned around and, uh, yeah, exactly. He said that's what Larry David does. Thank you. Uh, so I turned around and I said hello to this guy. He made a, he and I have something in common. And he said, oh, you know, turns out we have this thing in common. I said, oh, yeah, that's great. How are you, man? And he said, hey, you know what? Um, I've been meaning to uh, get in touch with you. And it turns out my company, Danger Bird, was doing licensing for his music. We had a film and TV and commercials licensing guy who worked for us. And we, we had brought in like Jack Johnson and Pearl Jam and all these, uh, the Temper Trap, all these bands that had nothing to do with our label or our publishing company. We just represented them for licensing. And Fitz was one of these people. And I was always like, man, that's some retro bullshit. Like, I don't want to, I come from Milwaukee. Like, people in, in the Midwest still love, like, swing music and all that. It's all cool. Like, I'm not taking away from it. But I, I just had a thing about it because I was trying to be, like, Mr. Alternative Rock Future Dude or something. I don't know what the hell I thought. And uh, so he said to me, um, I need some advice. Like, I need to sit down and talk to you. I need your perspective. I've been... Uh, I'm in a little bit of a corner because I spent all my money on this stupid band, paying these people, and I got about two months left in the bank, and I can really use your feedback. And so what he did is he sort of immediately got me uh, like right there on the table with him. He brought me in to his world, and he made himself human to me as opposed to like, what can you do for me kind of a vibe, right? So he, he broke it all down very smartly. So what I said is I said, like, come over in a half an hour. I got to do, like, some emails or something. I got, you know, I don't know. I just had to do something for, for a half hour. He came over, and he, he laid his whole situation out for me. And he, what I found within a half an hour was a real empathy for this man. I was really ingrained in what he was up to. And yes, and I'm going to bust myself on a few levels here. Yes, he had the whole thing, and he played me a couple tunes that no one had heard yet. And one of them was this fucking awesome song that just started open with the chorus it was like you guys ever see like any photos of like muhammad ali where he's just like pummeling some poor fool and you don't even know who the other guy is you just see the back of his head it's like this this song money grabber it's like it just gets you it's like an am radio hit and it doesn't stop and i was like thinking to myself like i like i literally thought to myself stop being such a jackass dude you gotta like um listen to more music and stop getting caught up in like, you know, returning faxes and sending people, you know, telegrams and stuff. Like just listen to music once in a while. So then uh, I made the guy an offer and it was done. The album was done. The artwork was done. He had two videos done. It was no wonder he had no money left in the bank. He'd done all this shit up front because he was like Alex, right? He was just going to go and do it on his own. But what he realized in his, in his situation is he wanted to have a partner like a label to do all the work and put up the risk capital for marketing, which is eventually what you guys did, right? Did that, yeah. In fact, I'll bust you much better. Thank you. You just busted Thank yourself. You. Please. I brought Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros demos to you, and he passed. Yeah. I was like, what is this, He's like, dude? oh, cool. Actually, I, had, I, don't that know, I, thought, I thought I had beef with this dude because he's like, oh, cool, cool. Let me uh, call you over the weekend. <laughs> Wait, never wait. heard from this guy again. Uh, basically, last I next never... time I heard from you was like two months ago. Like, hey, you want to do this sync up thing? <laughs> okay, that's <laughs> an exaggeration, you, dude. But but yes, did I really never call you back? Uh, I'm sorry. No, no, dude. definitely not. No, in I'm fact, sorry. I was even like, yeah, yeah, no, no. This sorry. panel just got so much better. Wow. <laughs> but but he's telling the truth. Yeah, but I, 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 I like that because it's like, well, you know. 
Maybe next time. How did it Maybe take, not. Wow. How did it take Probably a whole not. how did it take an hour for that information to just come <laughs> out? Well, we, he's exaggerating on the two weeks ago thing, but not really. But uh <laughs> but again, uh, I'm trying to tell you guys uh, thank you, thank you. But I'm trying to be I'm trying to tell you guys about the the BS in the head of someone like me because you're going to you're going to con be confronted by this when you're shopping your band if you're the artist, the label, a songwriter, whatever you are. And what I was expecting, we joked about this yesterday. Um you know, Alex, if you guys had never heard I'm a robot, um you know, they were like an edgy, what, what I always viewed you guys as was like this sort of the next step uh, in the L.A. tradition of like a band like Jane's Addiction, like super arty, super edgy, like Bowie meets Jane's Addiction, insane stage show. Alex did not look the way he looks now. He had a different haircut. He was, he was ready to go, man. It was, a, it was a different thing. So when he brought in his new project, I thought, oh, this is great. It's going to be like Jane's Addiction, like plus like even crazier crazy angular guitars and drums and it was it was it was not that song no. it was a different Edward Sharp song but it was a different trip and I was like I honestly thought to myself what the fuck is this like this has got nothing to do with <laughs> I'm a robot but again it was like um it was just uh I, it went right over my head and I and I I will say I've I have regretted it I regret it, and it's like the greatest, you know, they say the greatest revenge is success, and Alex has gotten his revenge on me, man. And it all happens at Sync Up. Yes. <laughs> all wow. right, so do any of you guys have any questions? We are going to rapidly run out of time, and we could gab all day. So uh, I, it, I'm hoping to hear more stories like that. Uh, but let's go ahead and get a few questions in so we can get out to Jazz oh, Fest. All right. Yes, over here. Hi, my name is Michaela. I'm a musician and I live down here in New Orleans. And my biggest love is live performance. And I'm, I don't have like a manager or anything like that. So I go out and network and do all my merch stuff and social media. And a lot of my performing friends, to find people to hear them, they like record themselves just singing on YouTube. And I've never done that just because like, I have my album online and everything, but I've always found that kind of unprofessional. But I'm in, from your point of view, what do you think of artists that just sit down at their camera and say, here I am? And send in, a, a, use and, that as a demo? No, well, yeah, yeah just kind of singing a cappella or with their instrument, just posting it on YouTube. And like, but like weekly, monthly. I mean, my, my, my take on it is do, do whatever do whatever, do everything. everything. I mean, you just do that, but don't let it sit there. Like, you know, you do that, do another thing, keep going and keep going. And one thing I, I wanna add is regardless if you go label route or whatever route you go, you do need a team. The bigger your team, the more powerful you are. And the more you trust them, the more powerful you are. So you get a manager, you get a this, you get a that, you get, you, you do need a team. So that's why a label, like we have, like Edward Sharp, like, yeah, I started a label to begin with, but it was purely in quotations. We, we linked up with another indie label to sort of do a partnership. Now I actually have a label that has, like, sort of a staff and we have a crew. But, um, but you do need a team. So, like, yeah, you do that and then send it out to someone. Try and get a manager or get something. As The further you extend your team, the more sort of power you have, and it has to be sort of this manic inertia, as Jeff was saying. As a, as a baby artist, though, it is not easy to get a manager right. um, and so you do have to take a lot of responsibility for yourself because the manager is not going to make any money um, the good managers aren't going to aren't going to be interested uh, if you find someone locally who you connect with who's willing to be a manager and you think has good business sense go with that for now but posting of a really lo-fi acoustic right. self-produced yes. just you know oh, yeah. uh, you know monocam hurt. from a laptop yeah. is that going to be a way to yes. break it? is that going to get your attention i would do that all day and, and if, if i heard your question correctly you're asking is it cool to do that i i would say do that all day go to your merch booth do that until you literally have like security problems, and then you just figure out a way to keep doing it, but to have people help you out with it. That's the coolest way, because what you're talking about is self-advocacy. There's a difference between advocacy and promotion. I talk to, about this all the time. And when we're doing our job right as, as non-music people, so label, manager, publisher, whatever you might be, you, you're best if you're an advocate. 
promotion is a whole other thing that we don't have time for here, but you should be your best advocate. You should be your chief storyteller. That's Alex has, is, is true. I'm not just saying this because I dissed Alex 10 years ago and all this history we have, uh, but, but honestly, you, you, are, you are seeing a guy who, who, has, who has exemplified the, um, the, the sort of autodidactic, self-starting, self-fulfilling scenario, and then, as he just said, built a team around that, mm -hmm. and, and, and actually spoke in very truthful words about his own experience up here, which a lot of people won't do. He took responsibility for the experience that he had when he signed to Virgin Records with I'm a Robot, and I, and I was there, I remember. And when, when Alex, who was the visual um, um, you know, visionary behind this act musically, as well as with they had this wonderful logo that was just one line, it was like a, like a one line drawing of like a robot dude. It was this icon that was all over LA, probably all over other cities when you were on tour. And he basically, if I could say my version of the story, let go of that part of himself and said like, hey, I'm here now. I'm ready to jump in this cool, awesome pool now. You should be your chief advocate and never let that go. So essentially do everything that I can to get. I just didn't know if someone from a higher up point of view kind of found that as a turn off. Like, no oh, they're way. not really taking it seriously. As long as the songs are awesome. Yeah. All right. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Never I, lose I, that. I don't go, you don't need to go on and sing, you know, some cover song because oh, yeah. then you're American Idol fodder. Right. Okay, cool. Okay. Thanks. Awesome okay, songs. Michaela. Go ahead and post yourself on you YouTube wanna, all day. Can we take turns side to side yes, here? Yes, please. Hi, Kim Bergeron, and I am a staunch advocate for art, visual and performing artists. I believe that oftentimes they get the short end of the stick with whatever it is they're creating. And so my question is for Dick and Jeff, and I, I ask this not with disrespect, but with coming from a good place. Yeah, uh-oh. <laughs> and he's pointing at you behind your back. Um, having just watched Jared Leto's uh, 30 Seconds to Mars artifact about his struggles with EMI and the big label, and they, this is an immensely successful band that, according to the movie, and I know there are two sides, has ended up upside down owing its label despite its success. How can we protect artists, especially the smaller ones? There was a time when signing with a big label was the holy grail for musicians, and it looks like more and more are going with smaller labels in indie. How can we protect artists so they get more of what is rightfully theirs? I'm going to say um, I know that I'm being broadcast on the radio. Internet. And the internet. The internet radio. So I'm going to go on record by saying that with... With uh, you're right, okay. First of all, what you're saying has an inherent truth to it that uh, the people who are creating um, art should benefit from it chiefly, uh, whether it's visual art, we're in an art museum right now, or musical art, or what have you. There's no doubt about it. And I'm going to remind everybody that I'm, a, I'm an artist manager and I manage record producers, and I also run a label. So I, uh, I better respect artists and songwriters and, and the creative people or I'm in big trouble. But I will say this to you. I saw that movie, the Jared Leto movie called Artifact. And um, your point stands, but I'm gonna comment on the movie and say this. <laughs> it was possibly should have come with a scratch and sniff thing that when you scratch it, it smelled like complete dog shit. Because it was, it was just a complete farce. The guy, the thing we forgot about with Jared Leto's movie is usually documentary filmmakers have some objectivity and they are beholden to some greater truth in the world. So usually the subject of the documentary and the filmmaker, the person who's telling this, reporting the story are two different people. Mm -hmm. He was one and the same and put a a director's, you know, uh, pseudonym on it, which is fine. I don't think he really even considered the objectivity thing. But I would say to you that um, I'm an artist's friend, you know? Like I'm like fisherman's friend, the cough drops, you take them and they make your throat better. I would say that Jared's um, film was just malarkey. And the fact is, is that what he failed to say in the film was that EMI, rightly or wrongly, whether they owed him money or whatever, if you're signed to a contract with someone and you say, we're not turning in our next record unless you renegotiate the deal, they have every right to say, F you, you know, you can't do that. 
Now, whether it was cool or not, I don't even know all the details, but they signed a contract with a record company. That company spent probably five, six, seven million dollars over the course of years flying them all around the world, developing them, investing money in them. So the status of their royalty account would just be a factor of the deal that Jared and his brother and the other dude signed, okay? Mm -hmm. What he also failed to tell in his own story is that he was originally signed to another label. Remember Happy Walter's label, Immortal Records? Mm. He failed in the entire fucking thing. Pardon my language. I'm a little bit revved up about this. He failed to mention, oh, we were signed to this label who had a deal with Virgin Records. So we were already having, uh, you know, the, the watering down of our royalty stream, right? So they were spending all this money, and someone else had to get paid in between me and Virgin Records. And so he just didn't tell a truthful story. And then when he put up his math panels in the documentary that basically said in one panel, the label makes 85% of my money. It's just that ain't true. There's a lot of people that get paid in between, like, you know, when I drop $9.99 into iTunes and when the, when the artist gets paid. It's just not as true as what he said. But I will close on by saying, um, um, Jared Leto made a great film, and hopefully he's made some money off that film that he and his bandmates can pr profit from. But that film is not an accurate representation of anything, except the fact that Jared Leto is a super cool actor and makes a lot of money as an actor and was able to fund his own film and tell his own story. I've made, I've been involved in the last two 30 Seconds to Mars records. And the other thing that wasn't accurate about that movie is that Irving Azoff, I've made two records with those guys. I've never talked to Irving Azoff in my entire life. And he put Irving Azoff in that film as his manager the entire time. But never once was anyone who actually manages him as part of Irving's company in the film. So I'm just pointing out that yeah. there were right. a lot of inaccuracies about that film. All right, let, let's move on to a question over here. Right, my name's Kodak. Uh, like the I thank all y'all for showing up, uh, all the information. Um, I've done Jazz Fest. I was, in 2008, I was picked out of a couple hundred hip-hop artists, me and Dizzy, first local hip-hop artists to perform at Jazz Fest. Uh, I've done my own shows outside of, uh, you know, local hip-hop artists, showcases, brought in about 100 people, been on radio. Cumulus kicked me off when they bought out everything. Uh, my question is, when you get to a certain level, at what level do you know do you begin to uh, shop your product to labels, or do you just keep on building and wait for them to come to you? Shop or wait for them to come calling that's after you really built your question. story? That, yeah. That's a really good question, and I and I think that you know, the longer you can wait, if they them coming to you is puts you in the driver's seat. So it really depends on where you are in your. Uh, like what happened with 3D not T. Right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, if you have a if you have a tangible, tr if you have tangible traction in the marketplace, whether it's through sale of music or ticket sales, um, then you have something, and you want to have a label, then they're going to take a look at you. But if they if they're the ones knocking on your door, you have much more leverage. It's a t that's a tough one. Because you know you bring it too early, you you know you lose that first impression. Then you, but if you can if you can find someone, I think it's helpful. If you can pick someone out that's an A and R, or that works at a label that you know you can bring them your early shit, your later stuff. You can be like, hey, here it is, and that and you can have an ongoing sort of like, I'm going to send you the new thing. Here's the new mix. Here's the, and and you got someone. You you find someone that's willing to listen to you consistently, then you have. You have basically a, a sounding board at a label that is a partner that you're not blowing the first impression each time. So you build up some sort of relationship. And if you can find that kind of person, that's basically, in my, that's the best you're going to get from a label these days as far as like artist develop, uh, artist <laughs> A&Ring from zero to, to 100. Someone who is willing to listen through your iterations basically. So like I would say if you could find that person or those persons and just be like, hey, look, this is some early stuff or whatever it is, if it's premature, if it's not, then great. If you feel comfortable being like, this is it. But before that, if you could, you know, you could let them know and you think that they're cool enough that they'll be willing to sort of develop some sort of relationship there. Thank you. Yes. I mean, I, 
You feel this? No, way? I totally agree. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, then let's move on. <laughs> hey, um, Ben Shank, Panorama Jazz Band, New Orleans. Um, we, it's a terrific band. I think part of the key to our success is our weird instrumentation. I play clarinet, I've got banjo, accordion, tuba. Um, we've started a thing now where we're releasing one track a month, digital only. That, that, this is New Orleans, that's not weird instrumentation. Well, but here's, yeah, well, point taken. Um, however, it seems to me like in the world of music now, and it seems narrower and more rigid now than maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, where music equals guy with a guitar yeah. singing, or music, e you know, this is like these few tropes. And what we do is, you know, what, what we're interested in is not having anything to do with trying to fit this or fit that. We play yeah, that's great. Jewish God bless music, you. we play Caribbean music, we play Latin American music. It's all party music. But, you know, it's not what, like, we want a band from New Orleans, so they're not going to, you know. So, like, my, I'm not even sure what my question is, but it's a great band, it's a great sound, um, but it's not fitting anybody's pre-existing, narrow, rigid expectations. So, well, development or continue well, on their own? The, the uh, first of all, excellent use of the word trope. <laughs> <laughs> really <laughs> fucking great, I have to say. And I wanted to say, um, and I might have this in the wrong order, the clarinet uh, was the sexy instrument, and then the saxophone became the sexy instrument, and mm -hmm. then the electric guitar. Right. So if I have that in the correct order. So the clarinet definitely uh, needs, and we've seen the banjo come back big time. Mm. Accordion's hot now. And accordion's hot now. I mean, Alex Cla brought clarinet a lot is of my weird favorite. I put the clarinet on a, on my solo album. The clarinet's the, yeah, the best. Yeah, what a sound, right? Yeah. All right, you're ahead you of have, your time. I think you do have problems, <laughs> though. Like, you know, like, um, look at those paintings. That's a perfect example. An artist is supposed to create basically replicas with a slight change, mm -hmm. and that's a show. Yeah. If you don't have that, you're not a real artist, and you ain't going to get a show. Right. In fact, I have, the same, I have a similar problem, because I don't, I laugh, I cry, I run, I skip. So my album's, like... I get derided for having like two, the, the wingspan is too far apart. You, you're mm -hmm. really supposed to have just a thing. So people right. think they can't trust me. They don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. it, it's pretty funny actually. So, so now I'm actually gonna push it further. I just scored a movie. I'm gonna do, put out a rap album. I'm gonna do whatever I can to fuck right. people up. <laughs> um, and a, cl a, a clarinet <laughs> summit album I think is next, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but I will say within, within an album or within a project, it might benefit you to be like, okay, this is our red period. Now comes our blue period. Oh, so, so that you, instead of mm -hmm. lumping it all up all at once, all together, maybe mm -hmm. focus on one thing, be like, this is what we're doing right now. Right. And somehow, marketing-wise, I would say that you guys, that you let people know ahead of time, we do change. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, people will freak out that you're changing. Well, it's it, kind it, of funny. You know, th there's an echo of what Don was said here yesterday when he was talking about you know, I, I sign an artist, and the first thing people want to know is, well, well, who do they sound like? Right. You know, and Don said, well, shit, man, that, that, that's, I don't want to talk about what they sound like, because they don't sound like anybody. And I, I, that, that, that to, for him, he was, I thought that was really compelling. And he said, uh, you know, don't ask me that question. Right. But, and, but so what you're saying, Ben, is that, you've got this broad range of material, got a lot of diversity in right. the art that you want to play, but you're mm. finding that it's hard for people to wrap their head around because you're, uh, as Alex said, your wingspan is, is so broad that people can't make sense of it. So you've got to find a way to break it down and mm -hmm. organize it in a way that people can be receptive. So maybe we put out an album. Uh, well, we're not putting out albums anymore. We're just doing single tracks. Maybe, right. maybe that's... I mean, so there you go. So, so chop it up in ways that people can absorb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Cool, thanks. All right, you heard it here. Yes, we got time for two more questions, and then we're, we got to go. Uh, thanks again for putting this uh, this event on. It's, it's really all for you. excellent. We appreciate it. I'm, I'm Jana. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I'm Jana Herzen. I run a record label, Motema Music, and I, I really appreciated your honesty there about sort of somebody got signed that you got signed to the label and you just handed it over to them because I I get musicians all the time who. Who, people who come to the label, there's two types. There's ones that, that have their own vision and are actively going after it. And I, what was your name that just sat down? Ben Shank. There you are, yeah. I mean, is your audience responding to you? That's it. 
I mean, that's really the bottom line. If the audience is responding to you, then you're being reached. But it's very, it is very hard for us in the label industry because there are these little, you know, like we have to decide. I have a record label that focuses on world-influenced jazz primarily. I mean, all kinds of, or fusions. And iTunes will not, uh, you know, you have to choose. Are you going to go on the jazz link or are you going to go on the R&B link? And it's actually really an R&B project, but, uh, but it, we are a ja known in the jazz world, so we take jazz because we know that you know we're likely to get that brick on iTunes. So is going to happen. The question is, the question being, what? I'm I'm curious from you guys because you didn't talk very much about digital uh, marketing. If you are, uh, you know, really working with in terms of developing uh, people's uh, their footprint, you know, what you're really doing with the digital marketing realm. That's right. a whole it's other like panel. A, yeah, that is, that is, you're right. That is a, a very important subject, and, and we barely, barely touched on it. Um, there's but, so many different avenues, and, and I think we would have to have another panel for that. And for, for each act, um, there's a, there are certain ones that work better, whether they're, you know, some a, a, artists have big Twitter followings, and some artists have... Uh, big followings on on Instagram and and others, and some like to post a lot of videos. So it has to be. There's no one size uh, fits all in terms of social marketing. But the one thing that is consistent, and I I alluded to this really early in the in the the panel, and we never got back to it, is that that artists need to have a regular output to their fan base in today's world because everyone is ADD, and they're and and if you're not consistently communicating with your fan base and not just tweeting, but I mean putting up uh, new songs or you know a live, a live clip or something from the studio, then you're falling behind. All right, and the next question. Hi, my name is Julian. I'm actually from the Bahamas. I Me and my friends, we actually flew in to attend this event and I just wanted to say thank you guys for putting this on. Um, thank you for coming. No, no problem. Now, we've had a lot of success out in our country as it relates to music, merchandise, performances, and crossing over into the international market. Here are some challenges that we have, and you, you touched on it briefly. Um, we only have 200,000 people that live in our country. So when you sit down with a lot of a &Rs, they say, hey, your music is good, but you don't have a million views on YouTube, or you don't have 150,000 fans or followers. No one's going to sign you. There's no story there, I think, is what he's saying. I mean, already, I'll tell you, there is a story. You're from somewhere, like, you're exotic. Yeah. To an American, you're an exotic, an exotic bird. You just play up that card, and you're golden. Like, all, they, all anyone wants is, like, to be able to be like, what's he like? He's from Barbados. Cool. Like you yeah, gotta check the, him out. That, he wears all green. It's crazy. Yeah. Like <laughs> you got. He just wants to make some green. You just got. It's true. You gotta have a hook. And you just get, so use you just the play hook. that up. But you know what I mean? We've been I mean, using the hook, and we've been getting a lot of success with it as of recently. But yeah. um, I, my only question was, okay, I know tons of people who have millions of views on YouTube. They end up signing a deal, but never come out. You see what I'm saying? So. What does that mean, they never come out? Okay, well, I have a lot of friends that have, well, who bought their following, or, you see what I'm saying? And oh, you mean the paid YouTube yeah, views? Yeah, you okay, can buy the, YouTube the, views. The, 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 um, the, yeah, well, the hosts well, that people play. You get they what you pay for, I mean, it's bullshit. Right, right. I, I agree. Well, what kind of music do you make? Um, it's, it's, it's called Gumbay Pop, it's Caribbean, and then we have this thing called Junkanoo, so it's a, a cool fusion. And we're bringing it to this market now. Love that stuff. And next year, we're actually doing a, like a Bahamas carnival where we're showcasing our culture and launching the Bahamian talent to the world. Um, and the music has been really, really, really accepted. I have a, I've created a line dance called the Caribbean Sly. If you can go on YouTube and check it out, it's sort of like the electric slides and the wobble. And it's really took in a, a, a nice personality. And um, we're bringing it to this market. But I just wanted to say to my parents, just be encouraged. because Not because you're not signed to a, a record company doesn't mean that you're not talented or you, don't, or you can't have that success. Your time just hasn't been presented yet. But they're always watching. Am I correct? Yeah, yes. I'll, I'll even take that a step further. You don't need a goddamn label. 
Honestly, nope. you do not need a label to do whatever you want to do. The label is not the thing. You can go. You could do your whole thing without a label. You could just play live shows. You can. You can have a fan base that you go around. And you put out your own music. The idea of like, I think it's very like it's a it's a major blockade, and I think it can even warp your sense sensibilities of like how you're songwriting because you can start to adjust your songwriting to try and get a label interested, and that might be a major mistake. So the idea is more to just do what you want and believe in it, and then yeah, let them come. You play stuff, you play stuff for people. They say no, it's not good. I don't see a hit. You got to know that they're crazy. You have to know that they're crazy. And you're coming from an, uh, an authentic, rootsy kind of place, and people love that. So there's an authenticity to what you're doing, but also presumably you're, you're doing some exotic combinations with it and, and taking it in a new direction. But the cultural authenticity that you bring to it is not unlike what we enjoy here in New Orleans. So there's, it may not be, be you know, Christina Aguilera-type pop success, but there's, thanks to the internet, uh, yeah. there's a way for you to find your audience, for sure. I agree. You do not need a label. It's Coming from Seriously. the president of Electra it, Records. It's, we a, love good, that. You it's don't. a good mind frame. <laughs> even, if, even if eventually you get a label, the mind frame that you don't need one, I think, is more beneficial than the idea that you do. For your songwriting, for who you are, for your performing. Um, I, lo I really lost my way when I started trying to please my A&R that, at Virgin. That, that's really when I started writing songs where I, I, for a few years, forgot even why I was involved in music. And it really was a hard, hard road to get back to that sort of childlike creation place. Uh -huh. So I'm just saying it in that sense. Like, it's, even if you're on a label, it's nice to just be keep yourself. It, keep yeah. it pure. Yeah. 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 Be true to yourself. Yeah, and I actually, I've, you know, I've worked with a lot of artists who, who went through what, what you went through, and they, they, they had such pressure from the label to either write a hit or to replicate a hit that they happen to have that they, they went off the track. I, I signed Amy Mann back in the early 80s, her first band, Till Tuesday, and we were lucky enough to have her very first single, you know, Voices Goes Carry, Ten, Future. Voices Carry, and we won the MTV Award, and it was all, you know, it looked like all roses. But um, by the time it came to record the second album, she was already in a completely different place. She had moved away from synthesizers and and was more writing on acoustic guitar and and the label. All they wanted was another voices carry, and so they fell out of love with the act. And you know she had to break up till Tuesday and start all over as Amy Mann because there were, the expectations were too high for the band till Tuesday. What you're talking about, I will close on this is being an advocate for your own art, and it sounds like for, for your entire scene. And that, that really appeals, it sounds like it appeals to all of us. Yeah. It's really, really cool, and thank you for standing up and actually you know, shouting at us. It's really great that you're here, and thanks for coming here, too. No, no, yeah. no problem at all, man. I think it's, it's good to know, and it's good to be able to learn and expose yourself. And my name is Julian Believe, so all you guys can just look me up or just type in... Julian Believe? Julian Believe in Yourself. Julian Believe. Okay, or you can also type in d That's a great name, too. You got, a, you got two hooks. You got three hooks. Julian and, he, and, the, and the all green. And the green. green. He's exactly. only half hey. green, dude. He didn't even get the memo. <laughs> yeah. All right, Artist Thank Development 4.0. Closing Thank thoughts, you. guys? Do you have any last thoughts? Closing <laughs> thoughts? Closing thoughts, starting on my right. Uh, do you have any closing, closing thought thoughts. on Artist Development 4.0? Oh, oh, or go to Jazz Fest. That's uh, your closing thought. You know, there, there's not a, there's not a one-size-fits-all, as we've talked about today. So every artist has different needs and has a different growth pattern. So artist development, we can talk about it in the most general sense, but, it, but it, every single act has to be looked at. If you're the artist or the manager or the label or just the, uh, anybody that's involved, touches the act, is, they're, not, they're not all the same. And some have to walk before they can run and some can't be pushed too hard as like I made the example with with Amy Mann and there's other artists like Amy Mann who had such a big hit their first time and then they they wanted to grow and they they couldn't because they were boxed in you know my final statement is uh if you, if you're an artist somehow try and become the best songwriter you can 
retain that childlike curiosity that Alex is talking about. If you're on the business side, find that curiosity, never lose it. The day that you think you should give up is the exact day that you should not give up. Just keep pushing through. Don't forget to go for walks, ride a bike, take care of yourself, and be of service to other people in all seriousness, right? Because we all, we all take ourselves too seriously sometimes, and shit is hard. Shit's frustrating. So don't forget to be of service to other people and, and take a break from all this stuff once in a while. It's very helpful. Be a whole human being. I think. Yes. Alex? Yeah, um, I guess just to pepper the conversation with this side, and this is, doesn't represent my whole view, but um, at the end of the day, sometimes I put myself on my deathbed, and I think, what would I, what would I choose now? Or even 500 years from now, if I was able to sort of take that view, what, what choice is the right choice? What song outlives what other song. So, in other words, try and make the best art that you can. Because that, even if it's not popular now, it will last longer. Um, it will last longer. That's all. Well, that was profound. Uh, I got chills. I want to give a real special thanks to all three of our panelists today. Dick Wingate, <laughs> Jeff Castellez, and Alex Ebert. This was really great. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. We'll Wait, see you at Jazz can Fest. We thank, uh, I want to thank Scott for putting together a great conference. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Alex. That was so cool.